and welcome back to our second presentation of our afternoon session here at Art and Code Homemade. I'm Golan Levin, Professor of Electronic Art at Carnegie Mellon, Director of the Art and Code Festival and the Studio for Creative Inquiry. And I am thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Jorvan Moss, also known as Odd J, who is a California-based tinkerer, designer, rising Instagram star, and autodidact who creates wearable robotic companions and invents new forms of interactive electronic couture. Jorvan Moss, Odd J. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Uh, okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Ravon, but I go by uh, J online, and I'm a self-taught maker from LA. I'm all self-taught from college. I've been doing this for like five or six years now. Uh, I have a small little presentation here. There's a little version of me. This was actually a fan art from a friend um, who pretty much drew me with some of my other earlier ideas, inventions, and little toys and tools that I put together. Um, I've done a few events as well. I was able to meet Alex Glow, and we did a talk at Maker Faire, uh, San Francisco, back in 2018. I love doing those type of things. I love giving talks. I like trying to inspire people with what we do, and hopefully inspire people to build their own little robots. So I'm constantly, like, happily, passionately to talk about these type of things. Um, so I've been doing this for a little while. I've been mostly kind of self-contained. Um, I am very story driven, so I always try to build a robot based off of some type of genre, whether it be steampunk or cyberpunk or whatever you might think. Um, so yeah, I do a whole bunch of random like shoots here and there. And back before COVID, I was able to like take my robots out with me sometimes and I would just go out somewhere or like go meet up with a friend and I would just have a random robot on my shoulder. Um, of course, like I said before, did some more events. Uh, in these pictures, you can see the same robot is actually uh, one of my favorite robots, Dexter, who's a robot monkey. Um, I designed Dexter a while ago, and he's gone through so many iterations at this point. But this is literally a days apart. <laughs> like this is the one on the left is during a SuperCon 2018 course uh, hangout. 2019. Uh, and then I got really inspired from hanging out with all the other makers that actually went home and redesigned Dexter's face to look like it is in the picture on the right. Uh, this is me at DesignCon. So I am very big on design because, of course, we have to think of design when you're making a robot because you can't, I'm not really a fan of making a robot just out of function because you can make anything really function and make it look not that cool. It'll, it'll work, but it won't look cool. I mean, what's the fun with that? So I do my best to activate a lot of design into my work. So I'm gonna show you a little bit more of my work behind me in a second, but I'll do a lot of stuff like that. Uh, this is actually from an online maker fair last year with me, Alex, and our friend Angela, who did a talk on um, wearable robots. Um, very fun. If you guys haven't had a chance to take a look at it, it's definitely on YouTube. And we talk about, you know, all the design processes, the different materials, ideas. It was a very, very fun time to go into all the details of everything that we do. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is one of my other ones that I actually designed to wear on my head. It's, it's very small, but I've been trying to branch out a bit and not just wear a robot on, of course, my shoulder. I want to wear them in any other place I can think of, like my hair, for example. So I designed a robot to fit in my hair. Uh, this is one of my favorite robots. Um, his name is Widget. He's actually a wearable dragon. <laughs> I still have him, but I ran into some design errors and I just haven't gotten back to building a dragon because it took a lot of time just to get into that point. <laughs> and trust me, it was not easy. This is kind of like my design process. I do a lot of uh, sketching. I have an artist degree. Uh, I went to art school for years and got a degree in illustration. So I do a lot of sketching before I take on the design process. So I'll sketch out an idea, see if I like it. Then I go into Fusion 360 cat it up, you know, put all the design work into it, print it out, test it, see if I like it, see if it works. And then I constantly do this type of redesign. I keep things that I like. I get rid of things I don't like. I'll reprint parts if something is wrong with them or something I don't like about them. And I continue to go with that process. 
this is definitely one from, of course, my robot monkey, Dexter, um, some of my sketchbooks, and then, of course, a quick uh, print idea when I was trying to get the mechanisms together. A lot of the stuff I do is always very quick sketches. It's not very like detailed. It's not like fully illustrated. It's literally just trying to get the idea on the paper. And it really helps too. Like I have, like you see there, I have a sticky note in one of the sketches because I just needed to kind of figure out things. And of course I use different colors sometimes that way I can like draw around things and kind of see how this could look or how it's supposed to look or how it maybe will look. And then of course with the testing, <laughs> which this is my Dexter MK1. This was his first design. Originally, I was trying to wear him on my shoulder. As you can see, he is huge. He's way too big to wear on my shoulder. And I had the fun time of learning the hard way that it wouldn't work. <laughs> so the picture that left is my first outing with him and he literally broke in half. It was a very, very like no moment, but I, I take it in strides. I, a lot of times the first draft and the first design never really works out. So of course, being the person that I am, I literally saw what was wrong, took notes, went back home and I got back to redesigning it for it doesn't happen again. <laughs> so that taught me to build Dexter as more of a giant puzzle piece. So now I can easily disassemble him and reassemble him at any time, any way I really want to because if you're going to be carrying around a robot, you definitely have to think about what happens if it breaks or something, you know, messes up while you're out. So you have to kind of improvise or kind of think of an easier way for you can put things back together. That way you can continue enjoying your events or whatever with your robot. Uh, these are my, my last ones for my presentation part. Um, I did a lot of work on this new Dexter. This is him now on the left screen here holding the sticker super more detailed, a lot bigger than he used to be, a lot more movement, a lot more fluently. And I also got into the habit of designing mini versions of him. So on the right, that's actually one that I took with me to work one day, a mini Dexter who had a camera in his eye. So when I was walking around, he was able to take pictures and I was able to look back and look at those pictures later. That's going to stop the share. But yeah, that's one of them. Uh, also, because I was promised to finish this before the day, I want you to introduce you all to my current newest robot friend I call RX27. Yeah, I know, he's very small and cute, but he beeps. <laughs> I've been working on this one for about a month now, I think. Um, I started him back at the end of de December because I found out that I was going to get to some very obvious issues with making wearable robots, mostly, Mostly because they're so big now, because I put so much work and effort into them, that they have a tendency to break and a tendency to be too big when carrying them around. So when I designed RX here, he's extremely small, like compared to my head, you kind of see him. He's very, very small and easily to carry around. So those were my two big concepts when I was definitely working on this little guy. Uh, he also come. He also comes equipped with new stuff. I'm still working on. Pull it out right here, which are like little clipper hands, little grabbers, that I can easily take them. I can easily take them, put them in the cup, and give them attachments. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty much my main process. My main goal for all of this, especially because I know a lot of people. Um, always ask me if I plan to sell them, if I plan to do anything like that. And to be honest with you, I don't really plan to sell anything right now. I probably will get into the idea of creating a common wearable robot for the future. But mostly I got into this because I just liked building robots. I was not a very social kid growing up. So I got very into the concept and the idea to build my own robots. And when I came to be, I became a little bit more popular and things started happening. And I have a lot of people always asking me if I'm going to sell it, if I'm going to do this, is it going to do that? But for right now, I really just want to continue expanding upon it. There's a good chance in the future, like especially during COVID, this actually helped me a lot, that I spent a lot of time by myself because of the isolation and making a robot that I was able to kind of communicate with definitely helped me through it all. I spent a good time just 
thinking of if I wanted a best friend like R2D2 or Wally, how would they look? How would they move? How would they design? And this got me to an idea of what if I put AI into this robot? What if I installed a chatbot to it? What if not saying I want to get rid of the human experience, of course, but what if you could take your robot? I have a robot at home that if you live alone, you can't have a pet or a dog because of apartment rules. So you can have a robot to talk to you, that you'll still have that type of, I want to say, conversational intimacy with a robotic creature. And of course, that could help for the future. I mean, definitely a lot in science fiction, they have spaceships and like long journey type of stuff. And most of the time the people seem to be by themselves. So imagine having a little robot that you can just have on the ship with you and just talk to that and help you keep you sane as you go through years of years of space travel. So that's where I kind of hope uh, things happen when it comes to wearable robots. Yes, <laughs> sorry, that's pretty much any other questions. That is awesome. We have time for questions and there's a lot of questions for you, Jorvan. Thank you. No, no, this, this is good. No, this is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, I'm going to, can I start hitting you up with some questions here? Sure. All right. First, I, I, this is my question. Um, uh, uh, Kate Hartman has pointed out, she says, robot wearability sounds like a really exciting research area. And I agree. And it's not something that I think it's not really, a, it's not a phrase I've ever heard of before. Like, and, and so my question is like, what's in your opinion required technically and conceptually for a wearable companion bot? And, you know, both from, like, for example, in relationship to the body, but also in relationship to society. Now I'll give you an example of what I mean. Like one could say like, oh, well, there's special things that are required in order for it to actually like clip onto my shoulder. It can't just have regular legs. It has to have like, you know, a saddle or something like that, or, you know, some kind of way that it relates to my body. So what, you know, you're one of the world's foremost designers of wearable robots. You are, right? So now, <laughs> so, so tell us, if, if I wanted to design a, ro a wearable robot, you know, what, what kinds of things would I have to think about, especially in, in terms of like how other people see me as well? Well, definitely, I always think about size and stuff like size, definitely. And also how flexible it is. It sounds very weird, but if you build something like the robot monkey, um, my robot monkey has ball joints on it because they're flexible. So sometimes if you're moving very fast, I don't have to worry about like an, an arm popping off or something like that happening. You also have to think on where you want to wear it because depending if it's on your shoulder, you might want to have strong shoulders for one, trust me. <laughs> you might want to definitely look into something very smaller or something even lighter. Cool of that is when I did my robot spider um, and I made a little hair piece for him. He, the original one was too heavy. It was way too big and it gave me a headache. So I had to design it and actually make it smaller and lighter. That way it can fit on my hair comfortably. And How about out in the world in terms of other people seeing these things? Now, there's, there's some famous stories about people going through airports with electronics and, you know, getting in trouble with people who are very suspicious of what, you know, they think could be a bomb or something like this. And so, so what, how, what kind of, how, how do you create wearable robots these are, these are not subtle robots. You're, people notice them. They got blinking LEDs, you know, and they make mm -hmm. noise. T tell us about, about conditions for wearing them in the world. I've learned just for me personally that cuteness is key. Sounds really weird, but as humans, we have, of course, we project a lot. So I use a lot of LED eyes, especially like with RX21 here, to simulate like this is cute, this is harmless. Because I've noticed when it comes to robots that have like actual eyes, the actual like LED eyes that people can see, people see them as cute or cool. And I usually get away with them pretty finely. But things like my spider robot who doesn't have any real eyes, at least the one, the, hair, the wearable hairpin one, is more creepy to people. People see them, they're like, oh, it's cool and pretty. But since it doesn't have any eyes or even real face, just a giant LED for a head, people find that way more creepy. And people are a little bit less, you know, okay with being like approaching me about it or talking to me about it. So definitely, I think the design concept of cute and harmless in your mind because we're humans and Terminator has totally messed up our perception of robots. There's um, lots more questions. Uh, Leia actually observes that she's found an article entitled A Survey of Users' Expectations Towards On-Body Companion Robots. Um, but uh, other questions. Um, how This is from Vernell Noel, uh, who will be speaking later this evening. And she asks... Um, how has your relationship with these robots made you more aware of your own body, yourself, and other non-robots? 
Honestly, it's definitely made me more aware because I've actually started working out a lot more because I wear wearable robots. Like I used to just would go on runs, but since be, robots became heavier, I started like lifting weights where I can be strong enough to wear them all day. I learned that the hard way during Maker Fair back in 2018, wearing my Aussie spider on my shoulder all day. At the end of the day, my shoulder was both swollen and sore. So it was just heavy and it was literally killing me, but I didn't want to take it off because people are around me. So I just really learned to like strengthen my own body to be able to carry this. That's and a funny motivation for wanting to, to work out. <laughs> it works. It definitely, definitely works. Um, Barb, who makes things, uh, asks, um, how many hours on average do you put into one of these uh, bots? Um, on work days, I put in about five hours per day. On weekends, I put on the entire day. I'm constantly building things and working on things, and especially like my robots. Like I would sit down and sketch them out for about an hour or two, and then CADing takes a little bit while, and then printing takes a little while. But I have a personal rule that every day I have to work on something, whether it just be starting my printer and getting this part printed or doing a whole wiring thing. So definitely if not five hours or more per day. Wow. That's it. The practice shows. Can you um, tell us about your goggles that you're wearing? I don't think you've really shown us those. Yeah, I, I meant to, but I totally forgot. These are my, um, I call them, I call them magpie eyes and they're a wearable goggle lenses that are super cool. Uh, let's see if I can get them working right now. Um, I designed them after going through, I want to say a, a bad time. A friend had just, passed away and I was having a bad two days. So I had all these extra parts. So I just started taking some goggles I had and I started just putting the parts together. So I made these and I just made a quick video like, hey, I wanted my own cool like gadgeteer goggles. So I built these and I posted on the internet and they got really, really popular really, really fast. And it surprised me. It surprised me really, really, really quickly how popular these are because I wasn't thinking of them as, you know, something that was going to be a product or even a famous build. I just built them because I was sad and I had some stuff I wanted to just do. And now these work. Those are, those are great. Thanks. I'm um, just looking to see if there's uh, some more questions here in the chat. Um, people are loving your work. I think I think we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. Um, it's uh, oh no, there's more there's more questions. Here we go. This is, um, yeah, no, this uh, then we we have, we have a little bit, we have a little bit of time. Um, get, do you feel like these these? I mean, what's super what's what's super interesting to me is is that your work spans both sort of like like almost like Disney style sidekicks. The mm -hmm. you know whether it's the the lead character, the princess who always has the sidekick or the, the, the bad guy who always has the sidekick. There's, there's always this, this sort of sidekick culture in, in Disney, but there's also this notion of like electronic couture. There's a ton of style in what you're doing. And a question that comes from Claire is, um, do you feel like these pieces are part of a larger fictional or speculative world? Or are they about, you know, being with him and being with you in this reality? I want to say a bit of both. I mean, originally when I started this and I got even a little bit more popular, I was just building for myself. But during COVID recent times, I've kind of seen how important this could be in the future. And it's kind of taken a weird sensation where I'm no longer thinking of it as, hey, this is just me having fun. And now I'm thinking of it as like, hey, this is me having a chance to make something for the future. So someone else who are, is in my situation or if something else happened during a pandemic, you can get a robot. And I am a Disney fan, so that, I'm really happy with that comparison because I am a huge Disney nerd. So having this little robot with me, like I definitely plan when things calm down to go out with him and do stuff like that and kind of record people's responses because I think it will be an interesting, like you said before, a research subject that we can look into and then hopefully make this like a main thing, like a normal everyday thing. I realize you don't get out much from your room, partially because of COVID and partially because you're spending five hours a day making these things. But have you had interesting reactions in the outside world from, from folks who are oh, yeah. in the wild? Yeah, definitely. I've had, I have about three responses. Um, one response when I was taking the bus to work, I used to always bring my robot with me sometimes just because um, I would get some people who didn't like it. I've noticed people who 
didn't see the eyes or the robot had lenses for eyes, didn't like it. They would instantly kind of freak out and be like, is he recording me? And like kind of go really paranoid really quickly. So I had to put it away. Um, my second reaction are from like people who are just like, oh, that's cool. Or the tech nerds, you know, are just like, oh, how does that work? Honestly, my favorite reaction is from kids. It's really weird, but kids see my robots and they instantly don't freak out. They're not scared. They're just like, oh my God, it's a robot. And they just run right towards me. <laughs> it's, I have many stories of like me taking my robot to the mall and then like kids abandoning their parents to be like robot. And I'm just like, kid, go back to your parent. I'm <laughs> so <laughs> um, those are my three, like favorite, most reactions I get when it comes to like wearing my robot on the outside. I personally have very limited experience. I've made maybe two robots and, and um, I swore I was never going to make one again because it's just such a frustration when they break. And there's some questions about um, whether you travel with a repair kit and what's your field repair routine. Um, you can travel with a repair kit. I have a custom repair kit that has a plug and solder, some glue sticks that I've learned that you can like take a lighter, heat them up and use them as glue and things like that. But I also got really good when it came to the design process. Uh, I'll show you a good example really quick with RX here. I made sure to put all his circuitry pretty much in the head so I can easily fix any wiring issues by just popping his head open. And then he'll just do his thing without much of a problem. You start getting really used to designing things to break. So I constantly, when I take things out, I kind of expect them to break. And I have a personal rule that's more of if it breaks, it's technically working because now I know how to fix it. Um, that's, there's some questions also about sort of how you feel about the internet pressure, um, to immediately commodify the things that you love doing. It's very weird. Honestly, I don't really like it too much. I just got a TikTok like two days ago and I posted like, Hey, this is me video. And I already have like 3000, 2000, 3000 followers. And a lot of the comments I've been reading have been like, Oh, this is great. Or some of them are like, Hey, you know, teach us or do this and do that. And at first I was very nervous too, but recently I'm getting a little bit more confident with it. So I'm feeling like there's a need for this. So I'm getting a little bit more inspiration to do this because people are desperately asking me on different platforms. I think with that, we're going to wrap it. Thank you so much, Jay. This has been oh, amazing you. For, for you. Can you, can you share, maybe the last thing you could do is to share, share, can you share a view of what's on your desk right now? I think everyone would yeah. love to. Love my it. desk currently is filled with a whole bunch of random little things, but in the corner there are like my favorite like projects that I just keep on the side for I can always constantly look at them. Um, and then of course my desk table is full of just like 3D printed parts right now because I'm still designing RX's uh, extra attachments and things like that. My entire like background, so the periodic table up there for, you know, my weakest subject is chemistry. So I try to focus on that a lot now, but yeah. <laughs> Jay, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's really a pleasure to have a view into the, into your, uh, your world of fictional robot character, sidekick, co wearable cartoon <laughs> character, couture developments. Thank you so much. It's been great. Well, thank and you. Folks, in just a few minutes, we're going to pick it up with um, Tatiana Mustakos at uh, what is 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks a lot.